Well, good morning to you all. It's a true pleasure to be here today. I want to firstly thank you for the invitation to come all the way from Australia to attend this event and share some ideas uh, and some uh, uh, collaboration uh, with you today. I'm going to start with stressing that I love India. Uh, this is my eighth time here uh, and I've been blessed to see uh, the sunrise over the Taj Mahal on my honeymoon, uh, catch the toy train to Darjeeling, I've ridden the streets of Bhopal, I've explored Cyber City in Hyderabad, I've temple hopped in Madurai and Mysore uh, and, uh, and done many other things and I, uh, one thing I do know and it's just like cities, uh, the more I learn the more I realise how little I know. Uh, but I'm here not only to impart knowledge, but also uh, learn about India's urban future. Uh, and uh, one thing I am excited about India is its urban future, because I passionately believe in the transformation of cities. Uh, and, uh, and the introduction just now by our secretary here really stressed this. By 2050, uh, there will be a doubling of the urban population in India. So whilst transformation of cities is not only desirable, it is fundamentally inevitable. And that's the core essence of my new project, my new business, City 2050, which is this notion that uh, cities around the world need long-term transformative thinking to engage not only leadership and administrations but populations to be a part of the solutions and if we don't get it right in India we won't get it right in the world and this is the greatest urban challenge facing humanity in its history and I'm really excited to be playing just a small part of that. Now I could talk of lots of examples of urban transformation and I'm very humbled to uh, acknowledge that I'm often uh, recognised as playing a role in Adelaide's rapid uh, urban transformation but I'm a passionate believer that it's not the people in this room that are going to drive change, but the citizens of the city. And realistically, good leadership is always about inspiring people to achieve great things and how we engage our citizens, not only in urban transformation, but the urban financing is incredibly important. And so the core premise of, of my presentation today is I'm not here as someone from Australia to tell you how to run your cities. Uh, we share a common destiny in that we're both a little bit sick of uh, the British colony telling us what to do uh, and we both enjoy beating them at cricket quite easily these days. Although I can't talk about Australia's cricket uh, prowess too much at the moment. Um, but my belief is that India needs its own creative solutions based on culture, based on communities and based on its governance systems. And really is about stressing uh, that the more I learn, the more I realise how little I know and that India needs to provide and find its own solutions. That said, I'm a genuine believer that cities are like people. Uh, they're like the universe. We all mostly generally have ten fingers, uh, ten toes, a head, arms, legs, and the universe is run on some basic principles. And there are some fundamentally important basic urban principles that can be adopted around the world. I'm not really going to touch on those today, but certainly my future in India is about providing training and development for mayors, for commissioners, for city leaders and communities on those basic urban principles and how they're going to evolve around society and around technology. Uh, but keep in mind that context, Australia does have some highly relevant examples. Uh, we're a part of the Commonwealth, uh, we share a, a similar Westminster system, uh, three tiers of government uh, and outrageous levels of bureaucracy. So I'm not criticising you, I'm saying uh, we're all a part of the same club. Uh, but interestingly, in, in Australia's context, uh, and it's been mentioned, we also do uh, take great deal of pride in having some of the world's most livable cities. So The Economist magazine describes uh, an indices of livable cities. Australia is the 350th biggest city on the planet, uh, but it's the fifth most livable. Uh, and in fact, five of Australia's cities are in the top ten most livable cities in the world. Uh, but within that context, it's not really about boasting. It's about acknowledging that we now are still and constantly having a conversation around institutional reform. 
It never ends, no matter how good you are. And I believe the best thing that the smart cities agenda can do is generate the conversation. There is nothing wrong with talk, 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 talk. Because if you're not communicating, you're not articulating, and you're not sharing ideas, nothing will ever come from that. And so it must start with a conversation, and it must end with a conversation, and it must continue to be a conversation that you have, not only for months, years, but decades to come. Smart cities is a journey, it's not a destination. So I wanted to touch on some basic ideas uh, today uh, about uh, city governance and financing. And under the Australian Constitution, it's core to recognise that states are key, play a key role in infrastructure. Uh, we are an incredibly urbanised country. Uh, despite having a huge continent for only 22 million people, uh, the key to that is that most of it is uninhabitable. And about 95% of Australians live in cities. And so we effectively really do understand a lot about cities and how they play a role in our economic development, in our productivity, in our livability and our sustainability. Um, and we are now starting to think about the future of cities and the role of infrastructure as well. And we're having a conversation about more empowered local government, more powerful mayors, more powerful councils, bigger councils uh, with greater responsibility. And I understand that that is a conversation that you're now having in India, and I think there's a really key role in providing mayors and councils with greater powers and the opportunity to empower their citizens to get results, and also engage then as cities more effectively with the national government uh, to achieve a whole range of positive outcomes. Um, in terms of uh, uh, smart cities and financing, uh, of infrastructure in particular, uh, my interest in cities is, is the future. And I think one of the, the key principles that's coming out of infrastructure and financing of infrastructure is that we are now seeing a fundamental change in how people are using cities. There is a tipping point. It used to be that we built infrastructure for citizens to use it in the way that we saw fit. That is now changing. The digital revolution, the mobility of people, the ability to access information and use their smartphones to move through cities means that city citizens are now deciding how they use infrastructure. And we need to create models and systems that empower our citizens to use the infrastructure in the way that they believe it will be more effective for them. Gone are the days of big government, small community, and we need to now start thinking about big community and smaller government. So the key for me is the empowerment of cities in this space. There is a conversation, and uh, the former Mayor of Barcelona will probably uh, acknowledge this as well, a conversation around a world parliament of mayors. This notion that we used to say we were from India, but now we say we're from Delhi. Uh, the fact that someone from, uh, someone from California doesn't say they're from California, they say they're from San Francisco or Los Angeles. We are now starting to identify more with our cities than our states, our regions, and our nations. And the empowerment of our cities is going to be a very important part of creating that destiny. And it gives us the opportunity to connect nationally and, and locally. And I think for funding of infrastructure, this essence, this principle, is incredibly important. Now, I haven't got long, and so I, I will just touch on some other, other quick things. Firstly, funding. There is no easy solution, and I'm not here to tell you how to get billions of dollars. Uh, but it's important to think of projects at different scales. It is important to talk about uh, airports, freeways, big infrastructure, uh, and they're the national projects. Uh, I've got that. Freeways, rail, airport, and we've touched on those uh, topics already. But if we move down from the national, we go to the region and citywide projects around power, around water, and around waste. But I'm going to finish my presentation today on the local, because I think that is the piece that India needs to mobilise 
if it wants rapid transformation. Uh, housing, roads, city greening, placemaking, and transformation of spaces. And how these three tiers relate to each other is something that Australia has thought long and hard about, continues to debate, uh, but is something that we, we do quite well. So the national projects in Australia. Uh, very simply, we have Infrastructure Australia, an organisation tasked with a body, uh, with a, the responsibility of looking at nationally significant infrastructure projects with a detailed analysis of cost benefit, which then quite simply mathematically ranks projects for the federal government to determine its funding levels. And whilst this is a highly complex process, it uh, and one of the things that I'm always concerned about is it places a value in a cost-benefit calculation on intangible things. Uh, the process um, is designed, though, to actually make it competitive. It's quite similar to the smart cities competition that you have in India, where everyone is competing for the same money and the same opportunity. Secondly, I'll just touch on the state projects and give you one or two bits of innovation. In South Australia, Adelaide was a modern social experiment. We, there are no convicts where I come from in Australia, uh, no criminals. We were a modern social experiment, an act of Westminster in Parliament to create a new city based on land, human capital and financial support. Uh, and as a result, Adelaide was a consciously planned city and in fact has the greatest strategic planning DNA of any city in Australia. And what you see in a state or regional government is a 30-year plan for the state. That 30-year plan leads to a 30-year spatial strategic plan for all of metropolitan Adelaide. And that then leads on to a 30-year infrastructure plan. And interestingly and importantly, these plans are updated every one to two years. They actually have to reply, uh, provide a report to Parliament on the progress towards the 30-year plan for the state and the 30-year plan for the city. And this drives our decisions today, it drives long-term financing opportunities, and it drives partnerships. If your city, your region can determine its values and principles and define what it wants to do and what, how it wants to spend its money over a 20 or 30-year period, you will gain partnerships and you will gain confidence. If you want to invest in a company, you want to see the long-term plan for that company and, and know that you feel comfortable with where it's going. The key to this from a financial perspective is that budget estimates um, can actually be made on increased revenues uh, and, and actually then explore the opportunities for smart debt. You know, we all spend in our own homes based on our projected income. And cities will not know their projected income unless they have an idea of what land is going to be developed, when that land is going to be developed, how many people are going to be living in those places and how much tax they're going to be paying. And that in itself is key to financing the infrastructure that will in turn create that revenue as well. Um, an interesting bit of inv um, innovation that I just wanted to touch on in this space is the value capture from upzoning, which is important. So a piece of greenfields land, horticultural land, that may well be developed on a fringe of the city, if it's developed for high-rise residential development, the value of that land increases 100-fold or more. That value is not captured by the government to pay infrastructure. So this notion of exploring uh, an urban growth boundary around every city in India that then means that you can control the supply of land and governments can capture that up value and then use it to spend on infrastructure for those communities is, is one of the bits of information, uh, innovation that's being explored in Australia. Now finally, I just wanted to touch on the local because I believe that's where cities get incredibly interesting. And I think that's what makes them unique, and this is an opportunity for India, but also cities around the world. Um, I like to think of cities as a series of villages. London is a great example of a series of villages. It's not one great city, 
it's lots of great communities. Another great city that we always talk about as having villages is New York. It's a series of villages, all of them different, with different communities. And small cities just want to be big cities, but big cities want to be a series of small, authentic communities. And I think if we start to look at cities in that fine grain, we start to see the opportunities for finance, for change, and, and also resilience in our cities. And I believe that small-scale infrastructure is what drives real change in cities. So the future of urbanisation is resilient, local cells managing its own infrastructure. It's about creating success that can be envied by their neighbours, success that can be improved on by their next door neighbour, or copied and or replicated. Good businesses, good cities create change that is easily scalable around a community, around a region and around a nation. And so we're talking about generating local power, generating and capturing water and using it, managing waste in their own communities, about neighbourhoods growing their own food. Now it sounds small, but when change becomes preferable, cost effective, easy to do and scalable, that change goes viral. And we've seen that happen in cities around the world. Change is not linear, change can not happen, change can happen slowly, all by creating micro scalable responses to good urbanism. Change can happen in profoundly accelerated ways and that's what I'm interested in helping achieve. So it's not only driven by communities, but it's actually created by communities. And this is what I personally believe India needs communities that are empowered to create a better urban future. And one good example I'd like to provide is placemaking. So placemaking is this notion of getting communities and businesses to go into spaces and use paint, use pot plants, use cheap, easy resources you have sitting maybe in the rubbish tip or sitting in, in a storage area to try and experiment and create new urban systems. For those of you who have used Lego, you could think of it as instead of using bricks and mortar to build a city, use Lego blocks to build a city and then the local businesses, the local chamber of commerce, uh, the local community can move those Lego blocks around in the city at no cost and they're being consulted whilst doing. And once you understand the best type of infrastructure using this placemaking opportunity, you can now start thinking about gluing it together with concrete and creating a system that's been consulted on uh, with other people. Not only is placemaking being seen by the United Nations and by cities around the world as being much quicker and lighter, but it's profoundly cheaper way of getting infrastructure. And building infrastructure and getting financing is not all about just getting lots of money and building stuff. It's also about how you can save money to achieve more infrastructure outcomes. And this can happen street by street. In your city, you can develop one street and the next street over will say, I want what they have. And then they can do it. And then the next street and the next street. And before you know it, the viral process of change is well and truly underway. So it just isn't just funding from local governments, etc. The best example of a business improvement district that underwent fundamental urban change is the Times Square Precinct Group. Crime was out of control, the cars had overtaken the streets, and the New York Times had one of its uh, 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 delivery boys slashed. The CEO of the uh, New York Times said, I've had enough got all the businesses together and the result has been absolutely spectacular. People taking back the streets, place making, experimentation and all of a sudden Broadway is for people, not cars. And that's just one example. But this precinct group or business improvement district gets the opportunity to do place making where you can engage local traders, you can engage local leaders, you can engage local citizens, local schools, 
I've already met some Rotarians and the conversation around how Rotary can change urban systems is important. Um, they can plant trees, they can change how the road is used and they can share their resources to create the city they need to be more sustainable, more livable and importantly, much more productive. And that's about creating the local uh, spaces that suit local needs and re representing the local cake, uh, culture and creating new unique spaces that say, we are from Delhi or we are from Hyderabad. This is what we want for our city. So just regarding the future, when we do our cost benefit analysis uh, of infrastructure, I m maintain an, uh, that I'm actually quite concerned about the values and principles. We're applying uh, the last 20 years of urbanism to plan a future that we now know looks fundamentally different. Artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, uh, the share economy, a whole range of trends are fundamentally changing the operating system of cities today and we need to start thinking about that in terms of how we plan infrastructure. I'm not going to uh, lie, Elon Musk is a brilliant example and someone I admire. This is a man that's saying that maybe aviation isn't the future and looking at hyperlink, hyperloops, talking about trains that travel at a thousand kilometres an hour through a vacuum sealed tube from city to city. He's built the Tesla, the car that is going to change how we move through cities and the energy types that we use. He's got battery storage, which is now being rolled out, and all of a sudden energy security is a completely different conversation. And recently, of course, he's introduced the solar roof, a tile that is cheaper than a traditional tile that is a solar panel that you can now build an entire building roof full of solar panels. Um, and for me, uh, another great example and a client of mine is Airbnb. It's not just about the infrastructure we build, it's about the infrastructure we have and how we use it. There are 100 million empty rooms in the United States and these are now being used by local entrepreneurs who book them out for Airbnb in the share economy. And it's an opportunity for local entrepreneurialism and local use of infrastructure. I believe that India is theoretically, it already is, the greatest share economy on the planet. 80% of the vehicles on the road today in India have drivers. You could be the first country in the world to actually not have car ownership, where you could just get a car when you need it and really get to the point where you say you'd be a fool to own a car. I wouldn't want to own an expensive car in Delhi. and get scratched within seconds. So this idea of building an entrepreneurial ecosystem is in incredibly important uh, and the opportunity to actually get philanthropy and get your community on board comes from that clear strategic vision that needs to be set. Um, if there was a silver arrow and there is no silver arrow for city urbanism and, and transformation, if, but if there was, I would say it's a quality vision that engages leaders, that engages citizens and most importantly engages the children. India is a population where 50% of your nation is under the age of 25. And if the children can learn about the vision and aspirations for your urban future, they can apply it over their entire lifetime and be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. Because India's journey is a long-term transformative conversation. You know, infrastructure is vital, but the new urban era, era, it cannot solve all the problems that need to be done alone. Models that empower, models that inspire, and models that enact in a way uh, that everyone can participate in urban transformation will be the major element that will see the acceleration of change. I like to say the cities are not rocket science, they're infinitely more complex and I really look forward to being a part of uh, India's urban future. My, my wife, my boss, has given it the seal of approval and uh, sometime over the next year I'll be uh, finalising the registration of my business here and undertaking uh, an opportunity to offer cities, mayors, commissioners, communities training in urban transformation. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for being uh, here today, thank you for the opportunity uh, and I look forward to making a contribution to this great country.
Cheers.